Ich freue mich ungeheuer, dass der Samyamin unser Gast äh, heute ist. Äh, das war schon lange mein Wunsch, dass er nach Deutschland äh, kommt und mit uns zusammen diskutiert. Und es ist doch ein tolles Ensemble, was hier ist und war. Aminate Daure aus äh, Afrika und Samyamin. Wir, wenn wir daran weiterarbeiten, haben wir vielleicht eine Chance, unseren Eurozentrismus zu überwinden. Und das ist dringend notwendig. Ich danke euch, dass ihr hier seid. Ich entschuldige mich jetzt nicht, dass es hier so voll ist und dass deswegen die Luft schlecht ist. Ich würde mich ärgern, wenn es leer wäre und die Luft besser wäre. Man kriegt eben nicht alles zusammen. Ich will euch ein bisschen meinerseits nahebringen, wie ich Samyamin äh, wahrnehme und äh, was uns äh, verbindet. Für mich ist Samyamin eine interessante Mischung zwischen politischen Praktiker, der das Weltsozialforum macht, und wissenschaftlicher äh, Analytiker und Stratege. Äh, wir haben nicht mehr so viele marxistische Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler und Sam, Samyamin ist für mich immer ein marxistischer Wissenschaftler, wo man sehr viel von lernen kann. Das brauchen wir dringend. Man muss eine, Beweg eine Gesellschaft erkennen, wenn man sie verändern will. Und dafür bin ich sehr, sehr dankbar. Wenn man die Texte von Samyamin liest, werdet ihr sehen, dass er zusammengebracht hat die Friedensfrage, Frage der Klimaveränderung, der Besitzverhältnisse in der Welt, als Klassenfrage mit der Überlebensfrage der Menschheit. Es ist mittlerweile zu einer Gattungsfrage geworden, zu einer Überlebensfrage der Menschheit geworden, ob wir es schaffen, diesen Kapitalismus zu bekämpfen und bitte sehr zu überwinden. Es ist nicht mehr nur eine Randfrage, es ist eine ganz zentrale Frage geworden. Und ich möchte sehr gerne, dass wir auch als Linke in diesem Bundestag, wo ja viele Fragen anders beantwortet werden, immer völlige Alternativen auch präsentieren. Wir waren die erste Fraktion, die im Bundestag beantragt hat, die NATO aufzulösen. Das hat alle entsetzt, aber dass es uns beiden gut getan hat, ist kein Argument, da, ist kein Argument dafür. Aber es war wichtig zu sagen, es gibt Alternativen zu solchen Kriegsbündnissen. Es ist wichtig zu sagen und zu beweisen, es gibt Alternativen zu einem System, einem wirtschaftlichen, politischen System, was auf der Ausplünderung der Welt beruht. Wenn es keine Alternative gäbe, würde die Welt untergehen. Und darüber müssen wir diskutieren in einem solchen Parlament. Ich möchte viel mehr, und Heike und ich, wir bewegen uns auch immer in diese Richtung, dass wir erkannt werden, dass die Linke als eine sozialistische Kraft nicht nur eine allgemeine linke Kraft, als eine sozialistische Kraft, die gesellschaftliche Veränderung will und dafür schreibt und diskutiert in einem hohen Maße Sami Amin. Dafür bin ich sehr dank, äh, dankbar, gerade aus seinen Federn Analysen lesen äh, zu, äh, zu können. Wenn es so ist, dass die Menschheit heute vor Überlebensfragen steht, war es notwendig, auch die stoffliche Seite der Produktion einer genaueren Analyse zu unterziehen. Das ist die Stärke, so wie ich es wahrgenommen habe, also mir in vielen deinen äh, Schriften, weil in der stofflichen Seite der Produktion die Demütigung der Produzenten bereits eingebaut worden ist. Man kann ein Fließband langsamer oder schneller laufen lassen, das ist nicht unerheblich, aber es folgt dem gleichen Grundprinzip. Äh, Prinzip. Und wir müssen solche Grundprinzipien Prinzipien der Ausbeutung außer Kraft setzen. So, wir haben uns das so gedacht, Samir wird zuerst äh, reparieren. Ich bin ganz gespannt darauf, was er sagen wird. Dann werden Heike und ich ihn ein bisschen traktieren mit Fragen, die wir uns noch ausdenken werden. Ich gehe davon aus, es wird uns schon noch was einfallen. Und da möchten wir auch gern, dass ihr euch am Gespräch beteiligen. Beteiligt, wir geben einfach das Mikro dann runter. Wir machen alle Türen auf, dass ein bisschen Luft äh, reinkommt. Äh, da ist eine Tür. Da, die kann man aufmachen. Seele ohne Licht sind blöd und ohne Luft erst recht. Und äh, halte das aus, wenn wir hier alle rausgehen und sagen, wir sind ein bisschen klüger geworden. Es ist doch toll für diesen Abend. Herzlich willkommen. Danke euch für den Besuch. Samir, jetzt bist du dran.
gebt dir einfach das Mikro, ja? Danke sehr. Thank you. Well, my dear comrades, I am very happy to have this opportunity for a talk with you and a debate, a discussion. I put my watch in front of me because I have a tendency to talk too long and I would not uh, go beyond uh, half an hour so that we would have some time for the discussion. Now it happens that uh, I have recently uh, published in German a three pages in this uh, magazine SPW um, the last issue, the issue of the summer, uh, the title of which, in German, I can read it, uh, but because it's only a few words. <coughs> um, Herbst des Kapitalismus, comma, Frühling der Volker, question mark. Uh, the paper is in some way summarizing my views, that is, we are in a very dangerous historical period, where indeed capitalism is in autumn, but the people are not in spring. There is no uh, coincidence between the two um, aspects. And therefore, we are in a period of chaos, out of which the best, but also the worst, could come out, depending on how the people conduct their struggle. Now, this is a very short paper. I will uh, give to the organizers a few copies, three copies of it in German. And uh, you can perhaps in some way have it uh, emailed to everybody. But the magazine, I guess, is known, SPW. Now, what I uh, would like to say is uh, the following. One, my reading of uh, historical capitalism is not the one which is the most common among us, I mean among the Marxists. About the others, I don't care. It's, I'm not interested in their views. Um, this view, which is mine, is the following. Capitalism had a very long period of incubation. 10 centuries, not the three centuries of mercantilism for Western Europe, but 10 centuries starting in China in the 10th century. That is 11th century ago. And then after this long, long incubation, it took its final historical form in a small corner of Northwest Europe, the triangle London, Amsterdam, Paris, and then uh, conquered gradually, but fast, uh, most of the rest of Western and Central Europe. Uh, now, the 19th century is a short, short century, from the end of the Na Napoleonic War to the Paris Commune, 18, uh, 1871. It's only a little more than half a century. Uh, the period of uh, glorious uh, explosion of historical capitalism was very short. And then it moved into a long decay, a long one, which maybe the indicator was the Paris Commune, the first attempt of a socialist revolution. And then, uh, it went through a long decay during the f long 20th century, and uh, it continues into another stage of this long decay. That is a history like that, long preparation, very short. What is a century? For an Egyptian, is a, a one day in history. Yeah? Uh, <coughs> and then a long decay, a long decline, long decline not a revolution which solves all problems uh, relatively historically quickly in a few years, but revolutionary advances 
with advances and then retreats during one century and perhaps during the next century, the century in which we are living. Um, now, that is my reading. Uh, capitalism has been progressive during this short period in the sense that it has created the conditions for it being, for ending capitalism quickly. It has created not only the material conditions, that is a gigantic uh, a jump in knowledge, technologies, etc., capacity to produce, but also, in some way, uh, cultural, political conditions. Cultural more than political conditions, but political also associated to it. If we understand communism, not as capitalism without capitalist, or capitalism with a human face, or uh, a mode of production more efficient than capitalism and less unjust, no. But as a higher stage of human civilization. And that is something very different from just a more efficient and less unjust mode of production. Now, uh, this uh, long decline is repeating itself for the second time. The first time was as of the middle of the 17, 70s of the 19th century, that is, the years which followed the Paris Commune, which happened to be the uh, birth of modern Germany, uh, of the German empire of the Kaiser. Um, uh, that long crisis um, appeared at the end of the 19th century with the move from that glorious capitalism, industrial capitalism of the 19th century uh, to monopoly capitalism. Um, Hilferding, Hobson, but Lenin more than the two others have understood that this was the beginning of the decline. At that time, among the socialists, the communists, we, one would say, the Marxists of the time, and the Marxist parties of the working classes, only Lenin understood that. Uh, and <clears throat> this long crisis um, was, and what was the response to this first long crisis? I will come and say what I mean by long crisis. It was not a good economic policy, such as uh, uh, some of the Keynesians say, because Keynesian policy was implemented only after Second World War. No, the response to the first long crisis of decline of capitalism was a number of events of very little importance. The First World War, the Russian Revolution, uh, the crisis of 29, Nazism, Imperial Japan, the Second World War, uh, the defeat of, uh, of Nazism and fascism, and the Chinese Revolution. That was the answer to the first long crisis. It is a political answer. It is the answer right and, and left. There was popular France, but there was Nazism. There was uh, the First and the Second World War, but the Russian and the Chinese Revolution. So that is how a long crisis is answered at. It is not answered by a, a correct uh, uh, economic policy uh, of these or those but by the struggles of the people against the system or the system as it operates in the country in which they are living. And now we are exactly a century later, uh, 1975, with the end of the uh, convertibility of the dollar to, to gold, 
1973. As of 1975, the rates of growth and of investment in the triad, that is United States, Western and Central Europe, not all Europe, and Japan, fall to half of what they had been during the previous 30 years, half, from an average of 5% to an average of 2.5%. And they have never record, recovered since. That is, the crisis has not started in 2008 with the uh, financial breakdown of that year. No, the crisis has started 40 years before in 1975. We were not many among the Marxists and the socialists and communists to say it. Uh, Sweezy, myself, and a few others, but not many, said it and wrote it in the 70s. In 1978, we wrote a book on that start of a long new crisis. And therefore, we are also moving into a period where the answer to the crisis, good or bad, and until today it is rather bad answers than good ones which are given by the people, uh, this is the answer to that long crisis. Now, what I mean by long crisis of decline? You know, there is a lot of literature uh, on, and Marxist literature, on the crisis in capitalism, in capitalism. The normal crisis in capitalism is a U crisis. That is the very logic, the rationale of the logic, which has created the uh, recession, which has gen uh, generated the recession, after a few years, two, three, four, five years, of uh, readjustments, st some stru structural changes, but limited, that very <coughs> rationale and logic, the same, the same logic create the conditions for moving out of the recession. That is the normal crisis of capitalism. And there have been a lot, whether I, we are not going to go into details whether they were relatively regular or less, etc., global or uh, specific to some regions, etc., etc. But a crisis not in capitalism, but a crisis of capitalism, not a crisis within the rules of capitalism, but a crisis which question the rules of capitalism, is a crisis in L, which means that the a very logic which has led to the breakdown, and the breakdown since 1975 for the present crisis, uh, creates a situation of relative stagnation with no end, with no end. That is, it cannot, within its own logic, create the conditions that move out of the crisis. This is why I say that facing such a systemic, we can call it as you want, systemic crisis, <clears throat> I prefer to call it a long crisis of decline. In that case, um, the uh, challenge is, should we make, develop our struggles and efforts in order to move out of the crisis of capitalism, or the challenge offers us, offers us the possibility, but with no guarantee, of moving out of capitalism in crisis. This is the title of one of my more recent book, most recent books. Ending capital, uh, the crisis of capitalism or ending capitalism in crisis. Not because we would like it to be so, of course, we are all communists and we would like it to be so. But that's not the point. It is because it is the real challenge. There is no way out of that crisis within the rules of the game, the rules of capitalism. 
This is why the policies implemented could seem to any normal person as absurd, ridiculous. Continuing, continuing the endlessly the austerity policy, which leads to not the debt, the uh, debt being reduced, but the debt moving more yeah. up, etc., uh, etc. Et that is which is producing not any sign of moving out of the crisis, but all signs of deepening the crisis permanently. But that choice is related to who is the power. And here I come to my second point, perhaps. That is, we have, capitalism has changed. It has changed, uh, as I said, throughout long preparation, throughout the 19th century, throughout the first long uh, uh, crisis of decline, and it will continue to change. The first long crisis of decline was characterized by what is being called monopoly capital. And Lenin understood it. Uh, and his understanding was correct. The proof of it was the success of, let's say, the revolutionary ad advance which the Russian Revolution represented. Now, but now, as a response to the second long crisis, that is uh, starting in the middle of the 17th of the last century. And during a very short period of about 15 years, let's say between 1975 and 1990, that is very short, 15 years, a tremendous change occurred. That is a degree of centralization, and I'm using Marx's words, not concentration, centralization of the control of capital, of monopoly capital, has moved up in a gigantic way. That is a qualitative change, which has produced um, a change in the way the politics of capitalism is ruled. It was ruled in the 19th century by the bourgeois democracy with a strong and diversified right, and with a weak, but the nevertheless existent, left representing popular and working class resistance or uh, struggles for more democracy, universal vote, uh, social rights, and so on. Um, now, the uh, political power of capitalism is no more longer working on the basis of those rules. It is a perfectly oligarchic power. Oligarchy is not Russian. It's an oligarchy which is running Germany, running U United States, ruling France, every, everywhere, Britain, everywhere in the centers. Oligarchy. Uh, a handful. And this is why democracy has lost completely its meaning. Uh, you can vote freely, perhaps, apparently. It has no importance. Uh, uh, Madame Merkel said it's, uh, uh, that uh, any vote which goes against uh, the rule, uh, the demands of the market, is Ill illegitimate, which means that democracy is illegitimate. Is, has no legitimacy. Democracy is precisely the right to choose another system eventually. That is forbidden. Um, this um, owner of a uh, 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 um, uh, tax uh, paradise, the Luxembourgian, who is uh, at the head of the it's a scandal. Such a man should be in prison, not at the head. Younger uh, says that there is no democracy uh, which allows questioning the rules. He's speaking of Europe, of the European setup. Now, and that means 
that in order to move out of the crisis, you have to move out of the capitalism in crisis because you have to uh, disband uh, this oligarchy which is ruling. Unless you get rid of that type of political ruling, you will go no nowhere. Whatever are legitimate, and in some cases very courageous, struggles of uh, working people for maintaining what they can maintain of what they had conquered before, whatever legitimate and important are the struggles of women for the rights of, for rights of ecology and so on. Nothing of that will give any result, any result, unless the political power of this oligarchy is broken down. So, uh, that's the second point. We are, therefore, at a point where that is the second decline is the autumn of capitalism. But what has been until now the responses to that autumn of capitalism? Three uh, patterns of responses. One, in most countries of, let's call it the, the West, Europe and United States particularly, there are struggles and movements in struggle. Uh, but they are not questioning the consensus on the so-called liberal management of the economy. And as long as uh, they are therefore powerless. And the uh, curious uh, slogan, we can change the world without changing the government, in my opinion, is uh, very naive. Uh, the least is not only to change the government, but to change the power system, which is far more than the government. Uh, that is the beginning. So we don't have until now any important positive. This is why uh, we are living in such a confusion. But if we look at uh, the South and the former East, uh, Russia, China, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. We have two patterns of responses. One is accepting and adjusting, adjusting, accepting the unilateral adjustment uh, that is accepting a comprador state, not bourgeoisie state, which is just a, um, a, a transmission belt of the dictatorship of the oligarchies of financial capital of the centers. That is probably most in numbers of the countries of the South. But you have some others which try with some success or less success than they believe usually to um, without questioning the global system and uh, the principles of capitalism, which are questioning the pattern of globalization, which is associated with it at the present stage. These are not the emerging countries in general, because they are, each of them is very different from the others. I have no time to go into uh, such details. I have written on that, but <clears throat> I take the two most uh, promising, potentially, not actually, China and Russia. Hmm? That is, China is trying to associate two contradictory policies. One, take advantage of the pattern of globalization in trade, and investment, but try to control it with more or less success, uh, less success than more, but try to control it and associate it with a national sovereign project of constructing an integrated full 
a modern integrated industrial system associated with a renovation, a very specific pattern of renovation of peasant family agriculture uh, in order to, uh, and these are the two legs, but they are in conflict. How they uh, are associated, what are the result of the conflict, the contradictions, this has to be followed year after year in the history, in the modern in conditions of China. The other is Russia, with, which is much less than China, rejecting the uh, imperialist domination. Uh, that is the uh, domination of US and its subordinate European allies through NATO, and I am delighted that Die Linke is one of the very few parties in Europe which is uh, considering that you have to fight and move out of NATO. It's very central to the policies of uh, maintaining this ol financial oligarchy in power in the West. On the one hand, and this is what the Cold War continues. Now, the Cold War was not uh, an invention of Stalin after the Second World War. The Cold War was continuous after the Hot War, the intervention, 1917 to 1920 or 22. The Cold War continued from 22 to, uh, the, uh, to 1990 or 91 and continued after, and continued after, which means that this system has reached a point when, where it cannot tolerate any country, big or small, to try to be independent, not to accept the total dictatorship of the oligarchies, even through a local oligarchy. But in the case of Russia, it is not associated with a non-liberal economic policy. It is associated in Russia with continuing a liberal economic policy with all its social disastrous results. How this contradiction will be in the coming years um, um, uh, overcome, I don't know. It could be overcome by moving to the right, the destruction of the uh, wish of independence of Russia, or to the left, uh, relatively, by reconstructing another sovereign project with a meaningful social and economic policy. So, until now, we don't see in the world, and I, to be short, uh, this is associated at the cultural ideological level, both being um, with, um, with um, ugly choices of the people. That is, we are in a period where the uh, decline of democracy, instead of being a, uh, um, a associated with politicization and understanding that the people need a higher stage of democracy, we move back to fascism, to not to fascism, or neo-fascism, call it as you want, in the north and in the south. In the north, it takes the form that you are, can see everywhere, in France, in Germany, in uh, everywhere. Uh, and in the south, in the format of pseudo passeist uh, mythology, whether Islamic for a number of countries, which are Muslim countries, or Hinduist. I mean, it's, it's quasi fascist what has happened in India with the Modi regime following uh, the uh, Congress party regimes. Now, so. We are in a period, such a period, is a period as Lenin understood for the first long crisis. A revolutionary, potential, potentially revolutionary. But will this 
an opportunity be taken or not, it's not obvious until today that it will be taken. And that could be a very um, sad conclusion. But we have to be patient a little, not patient in action. We should act uh, as much as we can immediately and continuously, but patient with respect to the re result of those actions. Because, as Gramsci saw it, we are in a period where the night is not yet over, the day is not yet clear, and in the uh, gray, uh, <coughs> monsters appears. <laughs> and we can say that the power of oligarchies is a monster, Madame Merkel is a monster, and many others, uh, but also the responses are either um, nice phantoms, <laughs> like the movements, or monsters, like the fascists, or the Islamists, or the Hinduists, or I don't know what else. Hmm? Things of that kind. Uh, but um, the, day we, the, the day will come. And what we have to do, I think, as uh, not as academic Marxist, but as communist Marxist, uh, that is uh, always associating attempt to understand with, uh, with action, uh, political uh, action, uh, what we should do is to try to um, uh, create that um, understanding that the time is a time of revolution. And we should not lose the coming opportunity of that. Again, revolution doesn't mean a capital R and the next day everything is, is solved. I call it rather revolutionary advances, which create the conditions for further advances, but which can be also uh, defeated or um, move into blind alleys, uh, etc. All possibilities of that kind are coexistent. Now, so I'll conclude with the sentence that I conclude my very, very short paper in German uh, by Bukharin said once that uh, communists are opportunists who have principles. <laughs> opportunists in the sense, not of social democratic opportunism, in the sense of they seize an opportunity an opportunity for a revolution. <laughs> and they don't forget, leave it aside. So they are opportunists, but with principles to do something, not just to adjust and save the system. Thank you. Ja, we have some time to discuss. Thank you, Sami Amin, again. Uh, ich spreche jetzt auf Deutsch weiter. Ich habe gesehen, ich glaube, die Zeitung wird auch in SPD-Kreisen <lacht> gelesen. Insofern ist es eigentlich eine ganz gute... First, yeah, you need the translation. It's okay, English? Um, die Zeitung wird auch in SPD-Kreisen gelesen. Sie ist, glaube ich, so äh, nah, nah SPD-nahe, wenn ich es richtig gesehen habe. Insofern ähm, erreicht die Botschaft also auch ähm, andere Monster oder Phänomene, da bin ich mir noch nicht ganz sicher, ähm, in der Definition, in, bei deiner Definition. Ähm, du hast einen großen Bogen geschlagen. Wir, der Titel heißt ähm, Kapitalismus am Ende, Fragezeichen. Und du hast vom Herbst des Kapitalismus gesprochen. Ähm, da bin ich mir noch nicht so sicher, ob da ein Winter kommt. Vor allem, es kommt vielleicht ein Winter, aber in, in, wenn man in dieser Bildsprache bleibt, kommt natürlich auch wieder ein Frühling. Ähm, und äh, der Kapitalismus wurde schon öfters für tot erklärt. Und ich glaube, er ist hier in Europa erleben wir ihn stärker und barbarischer als äh, je zuvor. 
Der zweite Teil ist alternativen Denken. Du hast ähm, die Schwellenländer, die BRICS-Staaten angesprochen, aber vielleicht nochmal von meiner Frage, wo sind, die, wo sind die Gegenkräfte, die wir mitentwickeln können? Das, du warst Mitbegründer des World Social Forum. Die Kraft ist derzeit ähm, meines Erachtens nicht mehr ersichtlich weltweit zu mobilisieren. Auch die Linke hier in Europa ähm, konnte der Austeritätspolitik nicht viel entgegensetzen. Die Parteien, die europäische Linke als Parteien, aber auch die Bewegungen, obwohl der Wille äh, da war. Wo sind die Gegenkräfte und wo müssen wir vielleicht auch ähm, verschiedene Bewegungen zusammenbringen? Interessanterweise haben wir den größten Widerstand im Moment gegen den Freihandel hier in in Deutschland erleben wir das zumindest, gegen TTIP, CETA, eine Bewegung, die ja sich sehr viel erarbeitet und eine sehr trockene Materie hat, aber die breite Teile der Bevölkerung wirklich erfasst und darüber auch grundsätzliche Fragen, Demokratiefragen gestellt werden. Während sind diese Bewegungen deines Erachtens, haben sie eine... Zukunft mehr zu hinterfragen als punktuell äh, den Handel. Also haben Sie die, haben Sie die Kraft darüber hinaus, ähm, revolutionäre Momente aufzumachen, von denen du ja gesprochen hast. Das wäre meine erste Frage. Und die zweite, vielleicht ein bisschen noch zur Einschätzung der Situation in der Europäischen Union. Auch hier ist die Linke ja sehr gespalten. Sollen wir die EU als ein äh, trotz allem progressives Projekt sehen? das über die nationale Frage hinausweist oder schwächt sie nicht umgekehrt auch die Linke als Partei und Bewegung, weil es in diesen ähm, supranationalen Gebilde neoliberal dominiert, von Oligarchie dominiert, ähm, mafiöse Strukturen mit Juncker an der Spitze ähm, eigentlich den Widerstand schwächt. Also ich will erst mal sagen, diese Woche war für mich eine sehr schöne, lehrreiche. Ich habe Aminata zuhören können im Bundestag. Sie äh, kandidiert äh, als Generalsekretärin der Vereinten Nationen. Und äh, ich finde das einfach ganz toll, dass jemand kommt und sagt, hier bin ich, in ihrem ganzen Selbstbewusstsein. Ich will Generalsekretärin der Vereinten Nationen werden weil es ein neues afrikanisches Selbstbewusstsein gibt. Und das heißt auch für die Europäer, äh, habt euch nicht so. Also das war wunderschön, Sami Amin äh, zuzuhören. Und ich habe eigentlich zwei Fragen oder zwei Herausforderungen äh, äh, an dich. Also man, man muss ja darüber nachdenken, wie definiert man Sozialismus oder Kommunismus? Und Lenin hat es immer beschrieben als Demokratie bis zu Ende. Und ich finde das ein sehr schöner Satz, weil er auch unbestimmt ist. Was heißt Demokratie bis zu Ende? Das heißt, dass die Produzenten auch die Macht über ihre Produkte und wie produziert wird, erobern müssen. Also das heißt, wir kommen wieder dahin, denke ich, dass die Linke die Eigentumsfrage als eine der Grundfragen stellen muss. So, ist das heute äh, nicht nur durchsetzbar, das ist gar nicht äh, das ist der erste Schritt. Macht das heute einen Sinn, die Eigentumsfrage zu stellen, weltweit? Die Fusion von Bayer und Monsanto ist der größte Schlacht des Kapitalismus. Hier ist eine neue Macht entstanden. Und wir werden es mit sehr großen, machtvollen Konzernen zu tun haben. Wir, sind wir stark genug, den Kampf zumindest anzukündigen oder aufzunehmen. Und das Zweite und dann Schluss, also wir wollen dich hören, wir wollen dich auch ein bisschen provozieren. Du bist ja dann morgen bei der Friedenskonferenz hier. Wir sehen uns morgen auch im Bundestag. Wenn man das Kommunistische Manifest sich anschaut, wird es eingeleitet, dass alle Geschichte eine Geschichte der Klassenkämpfe sei, gewesen sei. Und dann kommt dieser Satz, die entweder mit dem Sieg dieser oder jener Klasse endete oder den gemeinsamen Untergang der kämpfenden Klasse. Hältst du das heute für, für möglich, auch als eine, eine der schlimmen Visionen, dass ein gemeinsamer Untergang der kämpfenden Klasse, der Gattung Mensch, denkbar ist? So, und welche 
strategischen Schlussfolgerungen ziehen wir wieder raus. Helf uns ein bisschen weiter, treib uns voran. Entschuldigung, ich habe vorhin durch dieses blöde Licht hier nicht gesehen. Da vorne sitzt auch Mamdou Abashi, unser ägyptischer Sozialist. Und äh, ich weiß aber nicht, ob ich dich als Kommunist oder als Sozialist äh, bezeichnen soll. Wie auch immer, ich freue mich natürlich, dass du hier bist. Alles Gute. I, I, I shall try to be very short uh, because there are uh, also questions and observations from the room. Uh, so one is that I think the, all those observations are very relevant, uh, I think. Uh, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> saying that capitalism is in decline call it autumn, it is moving to worse, that is to winter, uh, with more savagery and more destruction. Um, doesn't mean that this um, old man, probably more than woman, um, is going to die slowly, uh, peacefully. We have to execute him. We have to kill him. Otherwise, um, the uh, <coughs> the uh, it, it could be endless and endless. Uh, that is one very fundamental point, in my opinion. Now, and it relates to your third question, to which I, I shall come later. Uh, second, yes, indeed, the World Forum for Alternatives, which was created in Cairo in 1975, in 1997. Uh, was followed very quickly by 1999, um, moving, organizing the anti-Davos in Davos, um, which was one of the uh, elements which helped creating the World Social Forum. Uh, <clears throat> now, the World Social Forum has uh, uh, played a positive role, I think, by... Um, um, reorienting the attention at global level to what is happening in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, uh, particularly for the Europeans, who, after having been in the 60s, uh, tremendously uh, um, uh, enthusiastic supporters of the struggles for national liberation, Algeria, the Portuguese colonies, South Africa, etc. Even if it was a little naive, it was very nice. It was it was a uh, a sign of real internationalism. In the, it has been replaced by a um, very selfish and close uh, <clears throat> closing on uh, yourself, the Europeans within your small problems of Europe and daily life in the conditions of Europe. And now, <clears throat> second, uh, that was the role of the World Social Forum, the positive. But from the beginning, and some of us have been, uh, uh, have been uh, warning and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and criticizing, from the charter itself of the World Forum, Social Forum. Considering that the movements and whatever movement will change the world uh, with ideologies very close to this ideology, we can change the world by changing our personal attitudes. Uh, I don't think that the personal attitudes can change the world if we don't change the political system of ruling the world. Now, and I think the last uh, 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 meeting of World Social Forum in Montreal showed that very clearly. But we had similar indicators before in the previous meetings. Now, I don't know if this page is turned or not. It doesn't seem to me to be very important. But that relates to your question. There are movements which are very le legitimate and to be respected and supported. Uh, 
against uh, some uh, uh, projects, further projects uh, of uh, the uh, reinforcing uh, the rule of the, those oligarchies. The uh, transatlant transatlantic in, uh, trade uh, agreement is, is a, a, a pattern, a model of that. And I think that the reaction of, as you said, people and mobilizing them against it is positive. But this is only one of the many channels that should help leading to understanding more that this is only one, the most uh, extravagant, the most, uh, <coughs> uh, but its, its logic is not very different from the logic of all uh, neoliberal policies. Now, with respect to the European Union, my view is that the European Union has been constructed not by Democrats, but by anti-Democrats, systematically from the Treaty of Rome 57 to Maastricht and Lisbon. Uh, <coughs> in order to, as Giscard d'Estaing said beautifully, it has made socialism illegal. <laughs> that is, questioning the principle of the private property, including, of course, the private property of monopoly capital, is illegal. And it has been systematically constructed in that way. Um, you know, Monet, who is presented to the European youth as a big Democrat, was pro-fascist. He loved Mussolini. He even liked Hitler. Except, uh, he said once, uh, he did not Hitler to be anti-Semite to that, to that extent. Mm. Except that he was not bad. Mm. Uh, when... Uh, uh, he was presented to the goal uh, to, uh, to um, start uh, organizing the European questions. The goal said of him, Ce Vichiste, this man of Vichy. <laughs> now, which shows that the European Union is built in that way. Now, the European youth believed in that, in that construction and the media uh, maneuvered very brilliantly on two grounds. One is that after two major world, but European wars, as the first and the second, with the terrific uh, destructions it meant, uh, we are fed up of this hate, uh, chauvinism, and, and we want to be brothers, French and German and others, and British and, and Polish and everybody. Uh, that is a, a, a good reaction, but naive in a way, that this European Union would precisely create that, offer that. And also it was associated with the blah blah on democracy. Market and democracy are synonymous while market, which means the domination of oligopolies and of the oligarchy, is opposite to democracy. It's not supportive to it. Uh, but they believe that. And I think that until now, the vast majority of the European people believe that. This is why not only traitors, but also people whom I would not consider as such, are, say, we want another Europe. And they certainly want it sincerely. They believe that it is possible. I think that was one of the big mistakes of Tsipras, <laughs> to believe that it, it would, could be possible. It is not possible. And the proof has been, give, been given by the case of Greece. Huh? It is not possible. And therefore, whether we like it or not, the European Union is bound to implode. And it is imploding. Uh, 
Brexit is one of the signs, but there will be many others uh, following. Uh, <clears throat> in chaos. Therefore, I think that a correct strategy, and I'm not going to dictate a correct strategy to any of the European radical left. They have uh, other stronger means than I have to, to, to do it. But the general line should be, how should we move out of that mud and create sovereign, not bourgeois, chauvinistic, nationalist projects operating within global neoliberalism, but on a national basis, which is the policy of the US, has always been the policy of the US, which is to a certain extent the policy, to a large extent, the policy of Germany. The strength of the, um, of the oligarchy in Germany is stronger than elsewhere because of one of their major victories. The people of East Germany have been dispossessed of their wealth and country to the benefit of the financial oligarchy of West Germany. That was one of the most dramatic dispossession of a whole people. But now, so um, that European Union cannot. Uh, so if we don't have a, a national popular sovereign project, national not in the sense of ethnicity, hmm, but in the sense uh, the state uh, uh, which is accepted to various degrees as the, air, the arena for social and uh, political battles, uh, a popular project at that level with an internationalist mind and a pan-European mind. That is, those national popular projects are not conflicting one to the other, but could be on the opposite, the basis for, I would not say reconstructing, but constructing another Europe. But it has to go through the uh, de constructing of that Europe. I don't think that this Europe can be uh, changed. Now, uh, the definition of communism. Yes, democracy until the end means, uh, and it was what Marx had in head and what Lenin had also, that is, uh, democracy cannot be um, a a uh, ruling, a way of ruling politics through elections, party, uh, uh, respect of multipartism, etc., elections, and the economic life is ruled by ownership, private ownership, so called the market, which means at the present stage ownership of oligopolies. The rest is of no importance. The ownership of small enterprise the ownership of houses by people or apartments is of no importance, but the ownership of oligopolies is central. Now, that is um, the general line for strategies. Going. Now, simultaneously, uh, everybody knows it, Marx uh, uh, was not a um, he, um, uh, uh, was preventing the people from uh, cooking the food for, for tomorrow, eh? for after tomorrow. That is um, uh, uh, deciding for the future generation of what communism should be. They will have to invent it gradually. <laughs> um, now, Yes, the sentence of Marx in, uh, and Engels in uh, the manifesto is uh, fully correct and uh, has been, in order to save optimism, uh, simplified in the Soviet uh, understanding of Marxism by saying that uh, socialism is... Uh, uh, is no, nothing could stop socialism from... 
uh, from uh, being uh, uh, victorious in the in the battle. No. Uh, Marx said the class struggle can lead, that's the, the good uh, conclusion, by the victory of the new uh, moving up classes or by the suicide of the society, by the uh, uh, partners um, destroying their own society and they are often helped to de by others to destroy their own society. And that is what is going on. I mean, this is why I'm saying that Islamic uh, fundamentalism is the best ally of imperialism because it is making what imperialists had uh, not succeeded to achieve until now, it is destroying the societies. Not only it's uh, giving the power to some uh, reactionary powers, this has happened many times, but destroying the societies. Um, so we are in a process of destruction. This is why in 1979, as a conclusion to my book on class and nation, I made a parallel with the Roman Empire. Nobody speaks of the feudal revolution as we speak in the Marxist tradition of the bourgeois revolution and of socialist revolution. But nobody speaks of the feudal revolution. Feudalism came par la force des choses, by, by nature, in the absence of any uh, attempt to, uh, to be lucid and to have an alternative. That is why the move from, for that part of Europe, which included small part of Germany, only the western part to the, to the Rhine, eh? but Austria uh, also, um, France, indirectly Britain, because England was uh, partly included in that uh, scheme of the Roman Empire, and the whole Mediterranean area, um, was uh, not operated through a long decadence, which is the word used, the long decadence of the Roman Empire for the western part uh, from the first or second century to the 10th century, perhaps, when uh, the new pattern of uh, feudal uh, monarchies crystallized in basically in Britain and in England and France, hmm? um, and for uh, eastern part, uh, 14th centuries of decadence until the Ottoman took over. Now, that is uh, the other pattern. Uh, unfortunately, and this is why uh, the winter cannot lead necessarily and spontaneously to a spring, because in that case, we would say, oh, let us go to sleep and be patient. We'll have a, a bad winter. A number of people will die of cold during the winter. But then the spring will come and it, history is finished. Now, uh, the Roman decadence had a cost, which was terrific, uh, which was five or ten centuries of, uh, of moving back. If you look at even the demographic uh, uh, dimension, uh, a decline in the population, of many parts of Europe for centuries. Hmm? Uh, and, but today, uh, but well, at that point in history, uh, that could be, I would not say accepted, but that could happen uh, and, and not destroy for, uh, to the end, the uh, people of the region. But now we have means of destruction, which are, have no comparison with what they were. Means of killing people by hundreds of millions with atom weapons, NATO. Hmm? And that is the, 
the, pla the, the rational, the logic of tattoo is to be there to destroy eventually hundreds of millions of people, if need. And they think they have the, this need. Um, but also, destruction of nature. I mean, the ecological dimension has become dramatic to a point which has no, nothing to compare with the destructions, indeed, which occurred before in the long history of humankind. It's not the first time that uh, con natural conditions have been destroyed here or there, but it is on a scale which makes it uh, very different. And this is why we have to avoid that. <laughs> Uh, we have to struggle to uh, make um, the autumn of capitalism become also the spring of the people, which is not the case until now. Yeah, thank you. Um, wir sind jetzt schon zu fortgeschrittener Zeit, deshalb äh, öffnen wir jetzt für euch, für eure Fragen. Äh, ich würde vorschlagen, wenn die Übersetzung funktioniert, it works? Okay. Okay. Äh, wir sammeln ein paar Fragen. Bitte kurz fassen, dann können wir mehr Leute dran nehmen. Hier ist ein Mikrofon. Ähm, ich sehe ganz hinten eine Frage am Vorhang und dann gehen wir nach vorne. Dann hier die zwei dahinter. Und, okay. Und bitte kurz, ja. Ah, da waren zwei, ja, genau. So, lieber Armin, ich habe sehr gespannt deinen Vortrag zugehört und bin sehr damit einverstanden. Ich weiß ja auch, dass du eine sehr starke und kräftige Wurzel im Nahen Osten hast und auch zu verschiedenen Problemen der Entwicklung im Nahen Osten Stellung bezogen hast. Du hattest vorhin darüber gesprochen, äh, über die faschistische Gefahr, die im Süden droht, die konkret jetzt in dieser Region in Form des Islamismus droht. Kannst du vielleicht äh, dies ein bisschen weiter ausführen für unser Verständnis, weil wir doch in Europa äh, sehr unterschiedliche äh, Aufnahmen dieser Entwicklung haben. Also manche sehen darin eine positive Kraft, und äh, ich denke, vielleicht so ein paar Worten aus jemand, der auch eine Expertise aus der Region hat, wäre wichtig. Ganz kurz, ähm, ich möchte Pablo Neruda zitieren. Du hast vom Frühling gesprochen. Pablo Neruda sagt, man kann den Frühling nicht verbieten und nicht aufhalten. Und er sagt dazu, die größte Kraft in der Geschichte sind nicht Parteienprogramme, ist das Gewissen der Menschen. Und hier haben wir gesehen, zum Beispiel auf Lesbos, wo viele waren, tausende Menschen ohne Mandat sind hingegangen, um Flüchtlingen zu helfen. Und jetzt komme ich zu der Frage, die Flucht, wir diskutieren seit zwei Jahren im Fernsehen auf und ab, Fluchtursachen. Aber nie hört man Kapitalismus und Fluchtursachen. Wir wissen Krieg, Hunger, Klimaveränderungen, Menschenrechtsverletzungen. Und meine Frage geht dahin, ähm, auch die Linke, also sie Du hast ein Bild gebraucht. Wir sitzen ja alle in einem Zug, die Gleise sind festgelegt. Und jetzt verändern wir durch Wahlen, wir haben Massenmedien, wir haben Wirtschaftssysteme, aber die Gleise sind fest. Wir können einen Speisewagen machen, wir können langsamer fahren, aber wir fahren in eine bestimmte Richtung. Meine Frage ist, wer verlegt die Gleise? Wann und wo und in welche Richtung? Wir haben ja sonst eine gelenkte Demokratie und das wäre meine Frage, die du angesprochen hast, Krise und Kapitalismus. Wo ist der Punkt, wo wir die Gleise in eine andere Richtung verlegen? Samor, ist okay? If, if we collect Samor? Okay, jetzt genau, hier die beiden. Oh, Entschuldigung, Alex. <lacht> da in der Mitte waren zwei. Ah ja, hier und dann in, äh, genau, hier in der Mitte die beiden. Genau, nebeneinander. Thank you, Professor or Comrade Amin. Uh, for your presentation. My first question uh, about uh, the geopolitical struggle in the Middle East or uh, in the east of Europe, for, uh, for example, Ukraine. Do you feel this geopolitical struggle co uh, can consider as a response against the capitalism, which is, may can lead uh, to multi-polarism? Uh, 
So you can, uh, uh, could you uh, uh, consider it uh, as a response? If it is, uh, what should be next? Because you, uh, uh, do you feel that there is any indicator in uh, Russia and China uh, for any new uh, social economic uh, ideas? Uh, uh, this, uh, another question. Uh, there is some voices uh, talking about Russia as an imperialism. Uh, what you're replying about that? Uh, uh, third, uh, I want to uh, agree completely, if uh, I understand Mr. Wolfgang uh, correctly, uh, that uh, nobody nowadays talking about the private relation uh, uh, ownership, uh, uh, and I feel at the same time, uh, everybody, the economists, uh, talking about distribution uh, of uh, distribution of wealth, distribution of income. But I think and I feel the left should be uh, reconsider uh, the question about the private ownership relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amin, for coming. My question is, there's another Marxist economist and politician. Uh, he's from Syria. Dr. Qadri Jamil make an interesting comparison now that as Russians, as he said, could force Americans and Britain in the Second World War to fight against Nazism. Russians could force them. And now he, he has an interesting thesis that Russians could make it again to force, to force West again to fight against the new fascism, namely um, ISIL in the region. Do you agree with this thesis or you think we are going to what nowadays after the failure of the American-Russian um, agreement in Aleppo, people began to speak again about a third world, uh, third world uh, war. Thank you. Yes, because uh, again, it's uh, enormous questions. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I would not like to make uh, sweeping judgments on Islam, Islamic movements and so on in a few sentences. Um, uh, and I don't want to fall in uh, what could contribute to the so-called Islamophobia in, in the West. Um, Islam, as any religion, can be and has been in history understood in different ways. I was saying once in, on the Egyptian television, the discussing with the Islamic, who said, you are not speaking of Islam, you are speaking of the Muslims. I said, yes, I'm not interested personally in what is really Islam, uh, <coughs> Islam is Sahih, huh? but in how the Muslim people have understood their Islam in different countries at different times. And I'm, I would say the same with Christianity or with Marxism. I'm not speaking of, I'm speaking of historical Marxisms also. So we should, uh, we should be uh, aware of that. But the uh, present pseudo uh, Salafi, pseudo uh, passeist understanding uh, on the Wahhabi pattern uh, is not only super reactionary, but it is totally destroying the society. We could have another understanding of Islam. We could have a normal, what the bourgeoisie, whether Ataturk or Gamal Abdel Nasser and others, uh, or before Gamal Abdel Nasser, the waft in Egypt, uh, imagine that is a civilized, semi-secular state which uh, accepts uh, of course, uh, the Islamic values, but which considers that they are not the exclusive values on which the society, modern society, can be built. There were an attempt among the Muslims uh, to have something similar to what happened in Latin America, basically, with uh, Christianity, uh, liberation theology. Uh, in that case, liberation fiqh. Huh? Um, it was a Sudanese, Mahmoud Taha, who wrote uh, and struggled for that. He was assassinated. He was executed 
by Numeri and Turabi, the uh, uh, Muslim Islamic dictator presented in Europe, particularly in France, as a, a big intellectual. He's a simple criminal. He's not an intellectual. Hmm? Um, now, so that is the reality. Now, coming to the question of the last speaker, um, the strategy of the United States, and when I say the strategy of the United States, I mean, of course, and of Europe, which is only a subordinate ally, which uh, allies, uh, aligns itself spontaneously and, and totally with no, uh, uh, no restriction until now. Um, the strategy of US and their allies is to destroy any country which could become dangerous, that is, which could become uh, resistant to uh, the, this unipolar, uh, not unipolar in the sense of the US, but global uh, oligarchies, the oligarchies of the global West. Hmm? Um, they are among the countries which are where they are, uh, are where, and some, in some cases still are, dangerous. Number one, Russia. And this is number two, China, or China and Russia. I don't know in which order. But also, it happens that during the Nasserian time, we know it, during the Bandung time, Algeria, Egypt, Syria, and, Le and Iraq were major drivers of the movement for the whole of Africa and a good part of Asia. So, these are dangerous countries. This is why uh, they have, one of them has been really destroyed, Iraq. There is an attempt to destroy Syria in the same way. There was an attempt to destroy Algeria. The peace was supported by the Western powers. It was defeated by the Algerian army. It's half a victory, it's not a final victory. In Egypt, there was the attempt with the Islamic regime of Morsi. It has failed, not to, not to much better at all. But these are not total victories of the West and not, not defeat also, for sure. Now, so can Russia drive? So they are compars the Islamic movement. The proof of it, I would say, is given by how aligned totally and unconditionally are the countries of the Gulf. Uh, Wahhabism and market go together perfectly. And destruction of, because if Egypt or Syria and Iraq stand on their feet, Saudi Arabia wouldn't count with or without petrol and, and money. So, uh, can Russia, so this is an alliance between them. And I, I doubt that this alliance uh, will, could be broken to the benefit of a common front of Russia and the Western powers against uh, this uh, pattern of Islam. The proof of it, has been given, I think, by the event of uh, the bombing of Derezor, the Syrian army, by the US. It was not a mistake. If it were a mistake, it would prove that the Americans, in spite of their drones and all that, are totally unable to recognize what is going on the, on the, on the ground, which would be so ridiculous that it cannot be accepted. They've done it purposely. Why? Because the resort in the hands of the Syrian army has cut the, the connection between Daesh in Iraq and Daesh in Syria. And what the, the target of the US was to reestablish this connection in order to strengthen Daesh in Syria. 
by and possibly to help them, the Americans, to reconquer the region, part of the region of Daesh in Iraq and say that you see we are fighting Iraq by moving them to Syria. That was the strategic target. And I think that uh, it proves that um, uh, the uh, alliance between imperialism and those people, Daesh, Nosra, and so on. Well, when you see that uh, a French minister of foreign affairs in this side, Laurent Fabius, dared say Nosra is doing good job in Syria. Bashar al-Assad has never said that Nosra has done good job in France and Germany. Never said so. Hmm? So here you see the alliance. And it's all a lie when they say we are uh, fighting Islamic fundamentalism, blah, 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 etc. Now, uh, the question of migrations, it's gigantic hypocrisy. The, my, my, the, 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 the push to, the, to migration is the result of the neoliberal policies imposed on the countries of Africa, the weakest countries, Africa, the Middle East, and, Lat and some countries in Latin America. It is the reason, the, 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 you cannot say, oh, uh, <coughs> we, we should, uh, uh, we, you cannot speak of migration and keep silent on the reasons, the destruction of the societies by neoliberalism, which leads normally, you cannot lead to migration. Add to that the wars of NATO hmm, to destroy more some societies with success in Libya, success in, in, in uh, Somalia, success in Iraq, not success but not failure in the other countries including Syria until now and that is of course uh, reinforced so if we don't if we want not to be hypocrite on on um, on migration we should say it's not a, a, a little humanitarian action here and there which would uh, <clears throat> which can repair of course uh, uh, I love uh, when European people say we are, uh, we are open to those poor migrants and we should receive, welcome them. That is uh, very human and, and positive. But that's not the solution also, in the sense that if you don't stop the destruction by neoliberalism and wars in the South, you will continue to have a growing pressure of migration. Now, <clears throat> About the geopolitical struggle, the geo strategy of the US and therefore of Europe and Japan is uh, the military control of the planet. They cannot uh, operate as they had been operating in the previous time, uh, previous period, with uh, alliances with political conservative reactionary forces but uh, more or less having some historical legitimacy. Uh, they find less and less of those people in many places of the, of the South. And therefore, they have to give more importance to the military control. That is one of the questions that we shall discuss in the main uh, uh, conference uh, on... Now, to say that this unipolar system is bad and we want a multipolar uh, organization of the global system is per se not bad, acceptable, correct, but it's not enough. What type of multipolar system do we want? Do we want a multipolar, I mean, the uh, imperialism in the, in the old time, in the 19th century, and until the Second World War, was to be conjugated in the plural. There were uh, a, a U.S. imperialist, British imperialist, French imperialist, German imperialism, 
uh, and all them, all of them, in constant not competition, but struggle, including wars among themselves. Do we want a? It was a multi multipolar system. Do we want a multipolar system of that type, that is based on precisely national bourgeois, and at that stage it means oligopolies, as uh, uh, the uh, rule. Or do we want a multipolar system associating sovereign popular projects, whether in the north, in Europe, or in the south, or in the east, and therefore creating the conditions for uh, a, uh, of global relations, political and economic better. Now, one last point which is fundamental about private ownership. I think that we on the left, the radical left, we have to say, we want to put, to suppress private ownership of monopoly. That means nationalize as, as a first ste step. One can say we have seen in history and bureaucracy, blah, 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 etc., which is all true, but it is, the first step that you cannot avoid in order to create the condition for being able to socialize the management of that uh, public collective ownership. Now, whether the countries of the East, whether Soviet Union, East Germany and others have been, they have not been fully successful but I don't think that it has been the disaster as it is presented today. Hmm? Uh, the disaster of today is, is, is more dramatic even. So, that private ownership, it doesn't mean that uh, we are at, at a stage where we need, I don't know what will be communism of year two, 3000. Eh? Um, human, uh, kind will invent it, hmm? um, uh, but uh, at that stage, at least, certainly a good lot of private ownership and uh, possibly market relations, to a certain extent, uh, can operate uh, with also the abolition of private ownership for the monopolies. That is, without that, you will leave the, olig the, the uh, oligarch keeping their complete political power. So you cannot uh, destroy this uh, monopoly of uh, oligopolies on political power uh, through elections. I, I don't believe it at all. And we've seen it, and we've seen how the left and the right of the majority left and the majority right have come together now, or are so close that they are one party. You know, Nyerere used to uh, invite the United States, I don't remember um, which president was, they, uh, Tanzania is very sympathetic and good, but why do you have one party? And Nyerere said, because you know we are poor, so we have only one party. <laughs> You are wealthy, so you have two, one party. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that multipartism today is much a one party system. Ja, danke schön. Wir haben noch drei Fragen, die würde ich gerne noch, die würde ich gerne noch äh, dran nehmen. Kurz, bitte kurze, äh, wenn möglich, ku sich kurz fassen. Ja, hier vorne, Alex, direkt vor dir. Ja, genau. Und dann war hier, äh, ich nehme jetzt die dran, die sich vorhin äh, gemeldet hatten, hier und hier hinten noch, genau. Einfach dann am besten aufstehen nach dem. Ich kann mich gut erinnern an die damaligen Zeit von den drei Theoretikern, Samir Amin, an Equal uh, Development, Arige Emanuel, uh, Ungleiche Entwicklung und André Frank, Dependencia in, in Bezug auf die Development, the third word. Welche Alternative haben Sie today for the development in the third word? Thank you, Professor Amin. 
uh, would you agree um, on two points? Uh, actually, the oligarchies with their, well, in, in their decline, are doing everything to extract rationality, to extract uh, intelligent uh, reactions from the people via their media and via advertising. This is one point. And would you agree that if we fail to kill the dying capitalism, uh, there will be some sort of, well, let's say, feudal corporate fascism killing an enormous proportion of the surplus population, especially in the south, and secondly, totally subjugating uh, large sections of the population of the, of the northern industrial countries. Thank you. Thank you for giving us uh, food for thought. Two small points. The first one, destroying society help, ha would help imperialism. Would you please comment on that? And the second point, in your answers, you mentioned uh, that uh, war, they are telling war, uh, lies about wars. Could you relate this to the George Orwell's, uh, Orwell's 1984 about the Ministry of Truth? And if they are like being in a continuous uh, war situation, telling their uh, citizens something like that. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Um, yeah, it's weird to find in a microphone. So I first want to express some discomforts about some things you said, and then I have another question. Um, the discomfort is just um, you were saying like strong allegations in the case of Syria and the attack on the convoy and theories there and I don't know I don't think that you have any proof for that and it's pretty strong material that you're saying there and um, yeah I just wanted to say that. Um, second thing is that you uh, when you talked about the European Union you said um, that the project in general is a fail and that the ownership um, must go back to the national state. And I wonder uh, how this can be possible in a globalized world. And um, well, well, putting the national state in the center of the political, of the political focus, that's, that's somehow weird to me because isn't in a globalized world the question rather how to develop political instruments um, that fit to this world of today and national state is for me like a regressive thinking rather than a progressive one. Thanks. I, I don't think uh, we have time to go into the history of the uh, theoretical analysis of dependency of mine of others and so on but the alternative for the south is uh, the principles are, 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 are very uh, clear and simple which is uh, giving maximal chances to the maximal moving up in an auto-centered, which doesn't mean autarcy at all, but which means to try to, com to control the uh, external relations and therefore to compel the uh, other partners, which means the North, the uh, imperialist North, to adjust. The opposite of the structural adjustment, which is structural adjustment of the weak to the needs of the accumulation of the strength of the, the world the world bank asks the congo to adjust to the need of the us does not ask the us to adjust to the needs of congo hmm? so to reverse that relation which of course you cannot reverse 100 percent successfully in five minutes but you can move in that direction this is creating what I'm calling a uh, sovereign popular project. Now, about the oligarchy in decline, yes, the media play a big role. I, I'm calling the media to, today the mediatic clergy in the service of the financial aristocracy, just as previously we had a pseudo-religious clergy, a religious clergy, in the service of the feudal aristocracy. Uh, it's uh, continuously, continuously repeating the same uh, uh, lies. Um, continuously. <clears throat> now, and indeed, I am in agreement with your two observations. Uh, uh, the second one, 
to the extent that we fail, I hope we sh shall not fail completely, <laughs> uh, what is put in place is a feudal corporatism, uh, which is uh, quite fascist in its uh, way of, uh, of managing the society. Now, and this is destroying the societies. What, what, what this uh, system needs is for, it's not so much the market represented by those who are relatively successful, like China, for instance, or to a certain extent India or Brazil, the uh, market represented by the minority, but not a tiny minority of 1%, a 20% minority, which taking into account the population is a huge market of middle classes or new middle classes. But for many other uh, regions, and that involves the Middle East and Africa and good parts of Latin America, uh, the exclusive target of G this geostrategy is one, to ensure the access to fundamental raw materials oil, <coughs> petrol, etc., gas, minerals, and so on. And that can be uh, ensured by having enclaves military protected. And that is what they have. And the second, uh, financial razias from time to time, uh, moving into a country, stealing the... Uh, um, the uh, <coughs> the uh, economy or the uh, uh, savings of millions of people and moving within two days or three back home. That is what they have done in Argentina and what they have done in many other countries and what they are doing from time to time here and there. Now, uh, that is also the destroying society and therefore Destroying the society at that stage in capitalism uh, is, um, is part of the logic of the needs for the system to reproduce itself as it is. That is, means that the destructive side of, um, of uh, capital accumulation now is far uh, more visible and important than the pseudo uh, still ongoing so-called positive side that is uh, inventing um, you know, the variety of products, you know, the endless variety of products created which have a more or less similar use value. Now, I completely disagree with the, the friend who spoke in last. I think he uh, uh, represents for me typically the European who think that the European project can be um, can be um, modified and uh, in the good sense. I don't think so because just just uh, think of what are you going to do with the private ownership of the oligopolies in the in in Europe? Accept them then I think you are defeated completely, whatever is your intention. Well, with respect to the resort, let me disagree. I think the obvious proof is that this was wanted by the US. Otherwise, it would mean, and I don't want to repeat, that they have a military uh, capacity which is so bad that uh, we could imagine an Arab army making such mistakes. But that the US Army does it, I think it's far beyond the possible. Thank you very much, Samir Amin. Herzlichen Dank, dass du da warst heute Abend. Thank you for being with us tonight, discussing the whole evening. Ich würde mal sagen, für die Linke gilt es, dass wir nicht an, zumindest einen Rest äh, an der Kraft auch hier in, in Deutschland und europaweit mobilisieren müssen die, und verstärken müssen, die ihren Frieden nicht mit diesem System schließt. 
zumindest ansatzweise auch im Bundestag mit all den Schwächen, aber dass wir diese Position halten. Vielen herzlichen Dank nochmal für den Abend. Thank you very much, Samir. Ich möchte noch darauf aufmerksam machen, ja, ich möchte noch darauf aufmerksam machen, auf äh, zwei, drei Termine. Äh, Wolfgang hat es erwähnt, eine Friedenskonferenz internationale des International Peace Bureau in der Technischen Universität von 30. Ähm, September bis 2. Oktober. Da wird Sami Amin auch da sein. Ähm, da werden wir weiter diskutieren können. Es gibt am 8. Oktober eine äh, bundesweite Friedensdemonstration hier in Berlin gegen die NATO, gegen die Regime-Change-Politik, die Interventionskriege, die wir heute auch nur ansatzweise äh, diskutiert haben. Und es liegt noch aus, eine Information für eine Solidaritätsinitiative äh, in Athen und Lesbos mit Flüchtlingen. Wer sich darüber informieren möchte, liegt alles aus vorne. Und herzlichen Dank für das Mitdiskutieren hier. Und vielen Dank an die Übersetzung, an die lange beiden Übersetzerinnen und Übersetzer. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Thank you very much. Auch an die Technik und an alle, die, es hier, die das hier auch vorbereitet haben. Hier unser Fraktionsservice, die Marie Karge, der Alexander King. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Also nicht natürlich nicht der Fraktionsservice, sondern, sondern unser außenpolitischer Referent, Alexander King. Vielen herzlichen Dank für alle, die hier mitgeholfen haben. Und wir sind, wir brauchen mehr Austausch innerhalb der Linken, inter, der internationalistischen Linken. Vielen herzlichen Dank, dass Samir Amin dazu bereit war. Herzlichen Dank. Applaus